محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So we stopped at ظهر I think ها. Huh? Okay. So after the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had his siesta, his قيلولة, and he was notified by Bilal for Salat al Dhuhr. He prayed for Rak'ahs in his home as per the Sunnah, two by two. And then when it was time for Iqama, he went to the Masjid and he led the prayer with his congregation with the other Muslims in the Masjid. Now, the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, before, oh no, we did not go the, uh, reach there yet. Before doing his siesta, after duha, when we said that this is a blessed time, from sunrise till before duhur, this is a blessed time where the Prophet used to do so many, many things at alayhi salatu was salam. And among these things that he used to eat. So their lunch would also be at that time. But how many meals did the Prophet have alayhi salatu wasalam? There is no specific number. The norm among the companions at that time, the Arabs, they used to have two meals. One in the early morning, and this is called Ghada, not lunch. Ghada because it's done Ghudwatan in the morning. And one is called Asha, which is supper or dinner, but this is done between Maghrib and Isha. So this was the norm, two meals. However, sometimes they would eat yani, in between, and this is up to whatever there is available. So if we would like to dive in to the diet of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So what were the foods that he ate and what types did he prefer? There are a number of things if you look into the seerah and try to write down what he ate and what he preferred, you will find, for example, number one on the list is dates. This is number one. The Prophet والسلام, said, O Aisha, a house that does not have dates in it, the people of that house are hungry. So we should ask ourselves, how much dates do we eat? during the week. Unfortunately, some of us eat dates only when they break their fast. Yani those who follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in fasting Mondays and Thursdays, this is when they eat dates. Where we find that the Prophet himself وسلم, used to recommend eating seven dates of ajwa every morning <coughs> the first thing you eat why seven dates specifically from ajwa specifically from medina the prophet says whoever does this alayhi salatu wasalam would be protected from black magic and from poison so he would not be poisoned and he would not be affected by black magic with the grace of Allah Azza wa But you have to do this first thing in the morning you wake up every single day. Scholars differed. Why yani, uh, uh, specifically seven? Because this is from Allah. Okay, should it be any type of dates? Again, it's an issue of dispute. I preferably... Yani, uh, would recommend that it is from Ajwa because this is the hadith 
of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And the Muslims at the time of the Prophet salam, in Medina, the vast majority of their diet was made of, of dates because they used to grow dates and it was easily grown in Medina. And Mother Aisha's hadith that we used to see the crescent after the crescent after the crescent and fire would not be lit in the houses of the Prophet ﷺ and our only means of sustenance and food was water and dates, the two blacks, she said, al-aswadan, though water is not black. But this is in Arabic called at-taghlib, when you give the name of one thing to the other. So it's all associated. And that's why when we say the two moons, what do we refer to? The sun and the moon. And when we say uh, 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 Al-Umaran came, we mean Abu Bakr and Umar. We give them both names referring to Umar as if they're two Umars, but they're Abu Bakr and Umar and the likes. And the Prophet Sallallahu always broke his fasting over Rutab, which is the ripe fruit. And if not, then the dates, which is the dried fruit. If not, then he would just sip water. And he said that the best sahur, pre-dawn meal, the Prophet said, the best sahur of the believer is dates. All of this indicates what? That we have to have a lot of it in our home, next to our yani, uh, uh, seat and uh, uh, take as much, because it's filled with everything that is good in it. Yani it, it consists of the vast majority of what your body needs. And the rest of what your body needs is found in item number two, which the Prophet used to consume a lot of. And that is? Mm, a little bit, no. Milk. Milk. The Prophet used to drink milk, alayhi salatu was salam. In the hadith of the night journey, he was given a choice and he chose milk over, I think, honey and wine. And Jibreel said, you chose the fitrah, the natural inclination. With milk and dates, you could never go wrong because this has everything the body needs and you can live and survive on this for ages with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. Item number three, which was in the diet of our Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wives used to sleep night after night hungry. Yani they did not have any supper, did no food. What can we do? And the vast majority of the bread they consumed was made of barley. And this is something that a lot of us may not find tasty. We are used to eating wheat. And barley is not something that people look to consume. However, barley, by the way, medically speaking, does wonders. Subhanallah. It is one of the best medication for depression not Prozac huh? you take barley and it has substances that would cure or at least reduce your depression mother Aisha says at the time of the Prophet والسلام, whenever a person died we would go 
to the widow and to the family of the deceased and we would uh, uh, um, uh, prepare food and we would put a talbina on it. Why? She says, because I heard the Prophet والسلام, saying that a talbina is a cure to the heart of the, de for, of, the, uh, of the ill and it takes away sadness. Now this is the saying of the Prophet and by the way, this was reported by Bukhari and Muslim, which gives it a triple A grading of authenticity. So we believe this as we believe the Quran. Talbina, Prophet says, والسلام, it helps the heart of the sick and takes away the sadness, some of the sadness. What is Talbina? It's a sort of soup and it's done with two spoons, two full spoons of uh, uh, grinded barley whole, not selected, you, the whole thing, you just uh, grind it and then you add to them one glass of water and it is cooked over yani, moderate uh, fire, not to be boiled, for five minutes. And after that, you add to it maybe a spoon of honey. Why is it called talbina? Because it looks like laban, like milk, because of its white and its softness. Scholars of medicine say today it is the best of substances people can consume because it contains a lot of chemical components that would lower your cholesterol levels and it has many uh, uh, advantages for your neuro uh, connections. So it would calm you down, it would relieve you from your depression and introduce some form of happiness. No, it's not any roofies and you know drugs and but it's halal it's something that the prophet ﷺ used to advise taking component number four in the prophet's diet والسلام, honey mother aisha says and this is in bukhari and muslim the prophet used to love sweets and honey of course natural sweets huh? not chemical but honey was in his diet on daily basis, the Prophet used to والسلام, take water with a spoon of honey and drink it. He would not يعني, uh, um, like to drink water alone because the water of Medina was a bit salty, not very pure. And the Prophet used to love to drink sweet water. And sometimes he would go an extra mile and send people and some of companions to travel for a day or two outside of the skirts, uh, outskirts of Medina to bring him from a specific well some water that is sweet. So this was in the diet of the Prophet and I've heard doctors say to take this in the early morning like the seven ajwa to take it before having breakfast, to just have some honey with water. Some in, I think, the Far East do this with water that is a little bit warm. And they mix it with honey. Some they put some lemon in it. And they say that this is a magical portion that would yani, prolong your life, energizes your body, and gives you long life in Allah Azza wa Jal. Well, I don't care. The Prophet used to love it and do it. So we would like to know what the Prophet used to love and take. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, about honey. Of course, honey in the Quran is mentioned to be a cure that comes from the bellies of the bees. Allah says, fihi shifa. In it, there is a cure. And, and you know, Whenever you have cough, you know, uh, respiratory infection, flu, you just take like five, six 
spoons of honey every couple of hours and with the grace of Allah it's all gone it takes all bad substances in your uh, system and you spit it out and mashallah you're good as gold number five the Prophet Sallallahu used to love and used to consume meat so the Prophet wasn't alayhi salatu wasalam, following today's trend, being a vegetarian. Oh, I'm vegan. MashaAllah, you meet people, I'm, ve I'm vegan. So, MashaAllah, I'm Saudi. Welcome. What do you mean vegan? I don't eat meat. Why? So, no, meat is not good. I'm not a, a, a beast. I'm not a lion. Yes, but you're not a cow. <laughs> Why do you eat only vegetables? This is crazy. Yeah, I understand. You don't like to eat a lot of meat. This is up to you. But to say any meat product or eggs or fish is haram or you don't come near it, you're crazy. Our religion, every Eid, the Sunnah is to slaughter your sacrifice and the first thing to eat from is your liver. Not your own <laughs> liver, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, some people will understand wrongly what I say so and you have to be careful of what you say you have to always be careful not to be misunderstood and I told you this before they suspended my Twitter account for about three months and I had a fight with them why someone asks me Sheikh is it permissible to eat in Europe from KFC and McDonald's and I said yes the slaughtering of the Jews and the Christians is permissible <laughs> what do you expect happened? They suspended my account. They said, remove this uh, post. I said, why? I said, you said the slaughtering of the Jews is a Christian. Yeah, look at the question. The question is clearly, and I explained it. And the comments, everybody understood it. But for them as disbelievers and kafir, I agree. The post by itself is an encouragement for you to go and slaughter any Jew or Christian. I meant the animals slaughtered by the Jew and the Christians are permissible. So sometimes your wordings are very important. And I always tell people, it is a blessing from Allah to have a small you in front of you when you speak. I, there is a small asam sitting in front of me. So whenever I speak, he tells me, hey, oops, you did wrong, correct it or don't say these things. Likewise, when you write an email, always have a small you reading that email before you send it. Because the word in your mouth is like a lion in a cage. If I'm outside the cage, can the lion hurt me? No. I, the, the lion is in captivity. He cannot do anything. The moment the word comes out, the lion is out. He's going to eat everyone and me included. So when you write an email in response to someone's comment at work or a friend or a relative and you're angry, let it marinate. And come the following day, read it again. And you will find that you will edit 60% of it. Reword it. Don't send it. Come after two hours. Read it again you will edit another 15%. Then you may send it. And it would have the best impact and people will say, you're wise. But if you're impulsive, if you say and then apologize, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, do not say what you have to apologize of or from. Meaning that it's best to refrain from talking so that you don't apologize. But as if every time I say something and then I have to apologize, no, no, I did not mean this, no, I was wrong, I, this is not befitting at all. So meat is a type of food that the Prophet used to eat, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he used to love it, and the most he used to love was of, of the meat, the shoulder. He used to, zakallah khair. He used to love the shoulder meat. 
And the shoulder meat is the most tender, it's more tender than the thigh of a lamb. And in the Sahih, the Prophet ﷺ was invited when he was in Medina by a Jewish woman. She sent him an invitation to come and eat from a lamb that, that she slaughtered, a sheep that she is offering him and his companions. So he went, not knowing that she filled the lamb with poison, spe specifically the shoulder, because they told her that he loves the shoulder. So he went and accepted the invitation, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he ate one morsel, and then he spit it out. And he told his companions to stop, because Allah made the sheep speak to him and say to him, I am poisoned. Bishr ibn Ma'roor, may Allah be pleased with him, who was one of the companions, <laughs> he, mashallah, was very hungry. He consumed one or two bites, and he died because of that. So the Prophet said والسلام, to the woman, why did you do this? She said, I wanted to test you. If you were an imposter, you will eat from it and die. And I would relieve the people from your evil. And if you were a messenger, Allah would notify you and tell you. So now I know you're a messenger. So the Prophet وسلم, did not kill her. But because Bishr al Ma'roor died, there has to be compensation. So he gave his family the right to either kill a soul for a soul, or to take blood money, or to forgive. They chose a soul for a soul, and she was beheaded because of that. Now, this hadith, again, although it's not part of our topic, but it is very important to go through this. The Prophet والسلام, did not ask <clears throat> this Jewish woman, is the money you bought this sheep halal or haram? Because we are told in the Quran that you Jews consume usury and riba. So you steal, you lie. So this might be haram. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the money earned is haram on the earner. But if I give you as a gift, or you're my wife or children, and I give you groceries and I buy you things, it's halal for you. It has no impact. So the haram money impacts who? The earner. Clear? Number two, the Prophet ﷺ did not ask her, is this the biha or not? Did it fall from a mountain? Did you find it dead? He just went on the default of chapter 5, verse number 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 5, where Allah says, the meat slaughtered by the people of the book is halal for you. So we don't have to go out of our way to ask, oh Christians, did you slaughter it or not? Did you say Bismillah or not? It's sufficient for us to know that they're Christians and they're providing us with beef or lamb or chicken and I can say Bismillah and eat. Why do I bring this up? Because so many people make a lot of a fuzz about restaurants in the West, America, UK, Germany, and they say, oh, it's not Zabiha. Yeah, do you have ample proof and evidence? I said, no, but uh, these guys don't slaughter. How do you know? They're Christians. And the Prophet والسلام, ate from what was presented to him by a Jewish woman without investigating. He says, mm, okay, they're not Christians. They're atheists. How did you know? Oh, the vast majority of people in the country, they don't go to church, they don't believe in Christianity. But they identify themselves as Christians. So how do you know? Did you 
again, cut their chest and check their hearts to see what's in it? No. So the default is that they're Christians. And subhanAllah, the people make a huge argument out of it. We always say, Akhi, you don't want to eat in these restaurants? Good for you. Nobody's going to force you or put a gun to your head. But don't condemn others who follow the Quran and the Sunnah and the default and what Bin Baz and Ibn Ithaymin said and say that they are bad Muslims, they're not following the right path and they're wrong. You don't want to eat? Good for you. I raise my hat <laughs> or my shumag for you. That's good. But don't go overboard blaming others for not following what you believe because you are not someone to decide what is right and what is wrong rather the scholars and the uh, 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 the quran and the sunnah does this for us and allah knows best uh, number six <coughs> the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam sometimes ate rabbit meat Oh, rabbit is very nice. We like rabbits, don't we? Huh? Rabbits are very fluffy and, you know, Bugs Bunny. What's up, Doc? Yani, haram, ya khi. How do you, We can eat it. It's halal. The Prophet, alayhi salatu was was traveling once and the companions saw a rabbit. And they started fighting to catch it. And who can catch a rabbit? Yani, like a chicken. Can you catch a chicken? It's very quick in movement. So they kept on running and running and running until Anas ibn Malik, who's a youngster, who's agile, was able to catch it. He took it to Abu Talha. Abu Talha uh, slaughtered it, skinned it, cooked it, and sent the thighs to the Prophet. So the Prophet accepted it and ate it. So this shows you that also animals in the wild can be consumed as long as it was slaughtered in a halal way, whether it's a rabbit, which is a gazelle, a deer, uh, um, a moose, or whatever. Likewise, something that people don't know of, chicken. The Prophet ﷺ ate chicken. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari once was sitting, may Allah be pleased with him, and someone brought him a dish with a chicken. There was a man sitting with him, the man went aside and Abu Musa said, why don't you come and join us? So the man says, I saw something that you know, was disgusting. The Arabs at the time used to think that chicken is a disgusting bird. Why? In Arabic, we call it Jalala. And Jalala is an animal or a bird that eats waste droppings and you can see that the chicken eats whatever is found so if it's droppings poop uh, 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 meat um, uh, something rotten they eat whatever they can find so abu musa told him come and eat and the man said wallahi i'm not gonna eat <laughs> because he thought that yani, you're telling me to eat something disgusting Abu Musa said, come and eat and expiate your oath because I saw the Prophet ﷺ eat from it. Halas. Now we can eat, alhamdulillah, chicken without any problem because our Prophet ate it. Was it normal? Of course not. It's not as we find it today. It's not that easy to uh, have at that time. And I don't have any recollection of the Prophet eating some eggs. Though it's almost on daily basis we eat boiled eggs, scrambled eggs, uh, two sunny side up, medium uh, cooked. But at the time it wasn't found. But chicken, yes, we have alhamdulillah evidence to eat it. Also, fish. So the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam ate from the seafood. And this is mentioned clearly in the Quran. Anything that lives in the sea, you can eat. And when we say sea, we mean rivers, swamps, 
lakes, any water reservoirs. You can eat of it, regardless of the name. Now, some books of fiqh, they come to the sea lion. It's a haram. Why? It's a lion. Yeah, this lion is different. Than sea snakes, haram. Sea seals. And the, and, the, and the more they go. So anything that lives in the water is halal unless it is harmful. If it's poisonous or causes you medical harm, it becomes haram, regardless of the name. So you can eat whatever lives in the water. The issue is, okay, how do we know this? The Quran says it's halal. And Allah says, you eat from it uh, soft meat, lahman tariya. And subhanallah, seafood is one of the best. Yani the fish, the tenderness of it, it's so compared to beef and, and, and to lamb, it's so tender, very nutritious, very nice. <clears throat> In one of the expeditions, the companions ran out of food until they came to the shores of Jeddah, where I live. And they found a huge whale on the seashore. So they were hungry, so they started carving meat. And they say that it was so huge that a man in his, on his camel could go inside of the ribs. It was so big that a man on his camel walked, and of course they didn't have selfies, but at the time I mean, it would have been a nice uh, 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 click to take. So they ate from it and took as much as they can and went to the Prophet in Medina. And when he told, they told him, he said, the Prophet Sallallahu do you have some of the meat so you can feed us? So they gave him and he ate from it. So it shows you that the seafood is not to be slaughtered. This was a dead meat. They did not catch it. They found it lying dead on the shore. As long as it's eatable and it's not harmful, this is permissible. So if you're in the water and you see a floating fish, do I have to and you leave it because I didn't catch it? No, you can't, even if it's dead. And when you fish, do I have to say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Oh, I forgot to say Bismillah, Sheikh. Can I eat it? No, eat it, Akhi. It doesn't matter because seafood, the dead of the sea creatures is halal for us. Now, coming to something that may cross your mind. What about amphibious? creatures that live partly in water and partly on land, such as alligators or crocodiles. So what's the difference between alligator and crocodiles, by the way? Huh? It doesn't matter. If you see one, just run. <laughs> but I think, yani, the, the difference, I, I have no idea of Allah. I've never seen one, I'm not interested in seeing one. So people, a lot of people say, what's the ruling on eating it? I said, well, if you can eat it before it eats you, <laughs> that, that would be a plus, may, may Allah protect us. It's an issue of dispute. Because in the Sunnah, the Prophet prohibited eating anything that has a, uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you call it, nab. A sharp teeth, some men have <laughs> sharp teeth. No, yeah, it has something like lions, uh, canines or something like that. Yeah. Zakallah khair. English is not my first, nor second, nor third language, so it's lousy. So anything that has a, a claw or these canines and, and the likes, it's haram for us to eat. And definitely our friend the crocodile or the gator has lots of them. But because it lives in water, mm, now we are hesitant. 
So some scholars say, no, it's halal. And I'm inclined to say that, inshallah, it is halal because it cannot live outside water. Yeah, and maybe it can live for a day or two or three, but then it will die due to its nature. It has to be around water and use water, not to breathe, rather to sustain its, its life. However, we come to something a little bit more luxurious. What about the skin? Because we have many shoes, belts, and wallets that are made of gator skin. And I, th I believe that this is halal. As long as it is tanned, then it becomes halal due to this confusion. But it's best to avoid the meat of it. As for the leather, it's no problem. Number nine, something that the Prophet ﷺ used to consume a lot, which is vinegar. People say, vinegar? What, what do you do with vinegar? Now it's a luxury. It's, it, it's something you go to Italian restaurants and the appetizers they give you is some uh, garlic, uh, fried garlic with balsamic vinegar and olive oil. And you dip the bread in it. Whoa, mashallah, khalas, I don't want to eat. It's beautiful. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the hadith is sahih Muslim. Jabir says, the Prophet asked, do you have something to dip? And they said, wallah, we don't have anything other than vinegar. So he said, bring it on. And he started putting the bread in the vinegar and eating. And he said, oh, the best dip is vinegar. Jabir says, by Allah, since then, I loved vinegar. Khalas, as long as the Prophet consumed it and loved it, and it's good. Doctors say that it lowers your cholesterol, your diabetes, uh, apple vinegar is good, and, and the likes. Now, what is with vinegar that is haram? In Islam, if you bring the juice and add to it deliberately substances that would make it wine and then after a couple of days or more the wine turns into vinegar this is haram you're not allowed to consume it but if it turns by itself sometimes i make apple juice and i leave it and i forget about it for six weeks and i come and it's vinegar by nature then there's no problem. What about the vinegar we have in the market? Most of it is artificial and chemical. No problem. What about if I know that this is balsamic vinegar or vinegar made of red wine or white wine? If it's made by Muslims, it's haram. Because they purposely turned the substance into wine and then added few things to make it into vinegar. And this is haram by the hadith. But if it was done by people who think it is halal, like Christians, Jews, atheists, uh, Buddhists, uh, Hindus, with the end product where we get is vinegar, then there's no problem. Does the name impact the permissibility? Red wine vinegar. No. What is the end result? Vinegar. Is it going to intoxicate me? <laughs> Have you ever, I don't know, you guys maybe know better than me. Does vinegar by any chance intoxicate? Of course not. So therefore, there's no problem in the name. And this is another issue that a lot of Muslims are hesitant. Sheikh, can I buy this t-shirt? The brand is XYZ, which is haram. The name doesn't make things halal or haram. The name is a name. Some of the companions' name was Abd Manaf, Abd al Dar, and their name is idol worshippers' servant. Doesn't make it halal or haram. The actual product would. Okay. What number are we in? 10. Number 10. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ate cheese. Wow. So when he was in Tabuk, <clears throat> he was brought, and Tabuk is close to the Romans and the Byzantines and Italy. So maybe they brought him some mozzarella. So I don't know. 
they, they brought him cheese. He was in Tabuk and up north, next to, close to Europe. So they brought him a piece of cheese. He brought, he asked for a knife. He cut it and he ate it after saying Bismillah, which means that cheese is permissible in Islam by the Sunnah. The Prophet ate it, alayhi salatu We have a problem. Cheese in the West is usually done by adding rennet. And what is rennet? It's something to do with the intestines or with the pregnant uh, sheep <clears throat> that they take it from uh, it. And, and, it's, and it's something of en enzymes that would yani, cultivate or produce this cheese. So what's the ruling on it? It's an issue of dispute, but the most authentic opinion, and the fatwa is on this, that the Prophet ate from it, والسلام, though it was produced through, through this fashion, and the companions used to get cheese from Christian countries and from the Jews and from the fire worshippers without any problem. So it is halal. You can consume it with no need for you to go into the ingredients. Number 11. The Prophet used to <coughs> love and consume and eat pumpkins. Now, pumpkins are a huge family of plants. I'm not a good in, in, in biology, but the pumpkin, the big one, the red one that we know in Halloween, we know this. Also, there is the pumpkin that looks like a cucumber, but a little bit twisted, it comes green. And there is uh, the Indian pumpkin, which is uh, um, orange. Also, it's, it's uh, a cylinder type. All of this is pumpkin. And what they call it, um, I don't know, uh, kusa, kuzi, uh, zucchini. Is it zucchini, that's a small one? Maybe zucchini or squash. Some also, it's from the same family. So all of this, very beneficial. Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, when he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, when he came out, he, his skin had some deformity because of being in the belly of the, of the whale and all of what's inside, chemicals and the likes. When he came out, Allah Azza wa Jal grew a tree of pumpkin to shade him. And this tree, of course, was not a tree because pumpkin is on the ground, but it was all around him. And they say it has huge healing yani impact and effect on various illnesses. One of them is diabetes. It has tremendous impact on reducing diabetes levels and on skin care but you have to go through yani, those uh, specialists who know and have studied it and there's so many medical uh, studies on it all of this doesn't matter to us but it's an added value to know because the prophet used to love it we spoke yesterday that the prophet <clears throat> was invited by a tailor with Anas may Allah be pleased with him and he presented them with a dish, a, yani a meal, and the Prophet used to pick this pumpkin from all over the dish. It, it had also dried salted meat with it. But he used to pick the pumpkin and eat it because he loved it. Anas says, since then, I, it became my best and favorite dish. So. I always remember that the Prophet loved it and I used to consume it, alayhi salatu wasalam. Number 12. A combination I've never tried myself. I know people have tried it, but me, myself, I've never tried. The Prophet used to eat, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, ripe dates with watermelon. Dates, rutab, with watermelon. Mix them up and eat them. Now, I would not, I did not ever try this because I don't know how it would taste. 
And the Prophet والسلام, also used to eat uh, uh, cucumbers with ripe dates, a combination between the two. One of the narrations, he says, we, by doing this combination, break the heat of this one with the coldness of this one. Now, which one is hot? Which one is cold? Beats me. But if I were to think, I would think that the ripe dates is hot because it has so much sugar and it would give you energy while cucumbers or the watermelon would cool it off. So the Prophet is making this combination. I have no idea what benefit this is, but this is what the Prophet used to consume. And I bet you, halal betting, inshallah, from one side, you pay the money. If I lose, uh, halas, I forgive you. Uh, I bet you that if you do the medical researches and the physicians make medical researches, they will find wonders and miracles in it. Number 14. Another combination. The Prophet used to, alayhi salatu wasalam, combine between dates and butter. But this is understood, yani, okay. Some people like to eat dates with tahina. You know, sesame, I don't know what it's called in, in I don't think they have it in English to begin with. I think this is um, uh, uh, a Middle Eastern uh, thing. But lots of people love to eat dates with tahina. So eating dates with butter is, butter is always good when you eat it with things. The Prophet used to love it. The Hadith says that the Prophet used to love dates with butter. <clears throat> Number 15, an nabid And this is in Arabic problematic. an nabid linguistically means to leave something and nabathahu and leave it. This is nabth. In Arabic, anyone you hear him say nabid, it refers to wine. Why? Because wine usually is juice that is left for a few days until it becomes wine. The Prophet used to love to drink water that had a sweet substance in it, like dates, some fruit, left for one day and he would drink it. The, the, the uh, liquid would be juice. So what was the procedure Ibn Abbas says? May Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet وسلم, used to order his family to place <coughs> some uh, raisins, is dried uh, uh, grapes, in the liquid in the morning so he can drink it in the evening. Or to do this in the evening so that he would drink it in the morning. And by the way, the Prophet used to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we will hear later on, he used to drink this juice after breakfast and after dinner. So this tells you that this is how Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to enjoy drinking sweet things after breakfast, after a meal, and after dinner. So this would remain for him to drink, but not for more than three nights. On the third night, because he would drink this mixture, this juice, the first night. The second night, the third night, he would say, either one of you consume it or throw it away. Why? After the third night, it becomes intoxicating, has fermented. It starts to be intoxicating and no, there's nothing uh, halal in that. Number 16. Did we finish this? Uh, number 16. Okay. Um, well, actually, this is <clears throat> something to be done with a mixture of 
barley or wheat that would be roasted on fire and then it would be mixed with water and mixed with dates and these are the tribes of Arabia especially in the south they have this mixture they, some of them call it arika some of them call it they have it has different names and this mixture is very very healthy and, and nutrition it would give you a lot of power a lot of energy and the prophet used to uh, um, eat this and ask for it especially after fasting because it gives you a lot of energy after a whole day of fasting and finally the prophet as stated before sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to send his companions to bring him sweet water because the water in medina by nature in their wells is a little bit salty and he used to love sweet water so he used to send them uh, away uh, for that and drinking water is an essential how much time I have half an hour okay drinking is something essential in our life we eat and we drink and the Prophet used to drink alayhi salatu wasalam. However, <clears throat> there are etiquettes for drinking that the Prophet also taught us and practiced it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number one, from his sunnah, he used to love sweet water. Unlike what the super, super uh, uh, Sufis would say, because they would say, no, we don't drink anything sweet. We don't drink anything that is luxurious. So we would like to eat salted water, uh, rotten food, or food that is not some any, uh, old bread. All of this is not part of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ used to love to eat meat, especially the shoulder. He used to love to eat sweets. And he used to love to drink sweet water which means that as long as Allah made things halal for you yeah, enjoy it why make life difficult oh because I'd like to be closer to Allah and who told you that making life difficult for you gets you closer to Allah Allah made these things halal for us to enjoy without extravagance so you can do that without any problem among the etiquettes, it is sunnah to drink while sitting down. <clears throat> Anas ibn Malik says, the Prophet والسلام, prohibited people from drinking standing up. And Abu Hurairah said, the Prophet said, والسلام, one must not drink standing up. But, there are other hadiths that conflict with this. For example, Ibn, Hadi uh, Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank zamzam water while he was standing up. Narrated by uh, Ibn Abbas, reported in Al-Bukhari. Al-Nazzal, he says, I came and met Ali and I brought him some water, so he started drinking, standing up. So he noticed that I didn't like him drinking, standing up. So he said, there are people who hate drinking, standing up. And I saw the Prophet والسلام, did what you've just saw me done. What you have just seen me do. Meaning, I saw the Prophet drink standing up number three abdullah ibn umar may allah be pleased with him and with his father says we used to eat at the time of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, while walking we used to eat and we used to drink while standing and abdullah ibn umar amr may allah be pleased with him and with his father says i saw the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, drinking standing up and sitting down and also what Imam Malik reported in his Muwatta, 
Umar, Uthman, Ali, Ibn Umar, Ibn Zubair, may Allah be pleased with them all, used to drink standing up and reported that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and Aisha thought that this was totally permissible. So after all of these authentic hadiths, how can we combine between what seems to be conflicting? Ibn Abdul Bar said, it's very easy because whenever we have conflicting rules like this, it means that the hadith of prohibition would be degraded into not recommended. And the hadith of doing it would mean that it is permissible. And this is the best approach whenever we have two conflicting evidences, is to try to combine between them. And this is one of the means of combining. Secondly, among the etiquettes of drinking is that you begin with saying Bismillah, and you conclude with saying, Alhamdulillah. And this is what the Prophet says, uh, used to do, alayhi as-salatu was-salam. And whenever he used to drink from a vessel, he used to say, Bismillah. And whenever he took it away from his mouth, he would say, Alhamdulillah. And he used to do this three times. So he used to three, a drink on three uh, times, so he said, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah. And if he wants to go again, Bismillah, not that I want to drink coffee, this is not that good to drink it in three sips like that. And he would do this, alayhi salatu was salam. Now, this is a highly recommended sunnah because when you say Bismillah, shaitan avoids drinking with you or eating with you. And when you say Alhamdulillah, Allah forgives your sins. The hadith, when you say Alhamdulillah, Allah forgives all your sins. And this is really I mean, strange. Allah gives us the food and gives us the drink and blesses us with it. And when we praise him, he forgives our sins. What? Tell, does this tell you that Allah is most forgiving, most merciful? You don't have to be in fear of doing kufr, of doing shirk, of going to hellfire like shaitan messes up with your head until he makes you do things that displease Allah. Think positively of Allah. Yes, stay away from sin. Nobody says, go ahead and do sins and then eat and say, Alhamdulillah, wa razaqni. But when you do eat and drink and praise Allah, acknowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive your sins. Thirdly, do not drink directly from the water container. Why? Because people will drink after you. And when you drink, if you have a skin water container, people usually pour water in their glasses and their vessels to drink from it. If you come and put your mouth and drink from it, this would make people disgust with what's in it now because you drank directly from it. Not only that, <clears throat> you don't know what might come out. One of the people did this and a snake came out to him. So this is why it's not safe to drink directly from a big vessel or a water container. Rather, you have to um, pour it in another vessel. Number four, don't breathe in the vessel you're drinking from. Especially in the case when this vessel is used by many others. So in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we know that a vessel of milk would be brought and 80 people would drink of it. How is this possible? This is baraka. So the Prophet says, Bismillah, drinks from it. Then he gives it to 80 people afterwards. They drink their fill. They're all full, khalas. Then he gives it to Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira narrates his hadith. He says, I used to starve 
and I did not have any food. When did Abu Huraira accept Islam? Any idea? On the seventh year of Hijrah, the, the year of Khaybar, seventh. When did the Prophet die? Long time ago. Good, mashallah. Think, this is your history. Which year? 11th. The 11th year of Hijrah. In Rabi' al Awwal, on the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal. All scholars agree. He died on what? On the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal, which is what the, 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 the innovators celebrate his Mawlid. So every year when they celebrate his mawlid, actually they're commemorating his death and enjoying it. But they don't know. They're ignorant. So Abu Huraira accepted Islam only for four years. Yet he narrated the vast majority of a hadith. Why? He was asked this. How come you only accompanied the Prophet for four years? Other companions accompanied him for 23 years and did not even narrate 10% of what you did. He said, everyone had to make a living. They all had to farm, they go to the market, they sell and buy, they had errands, they had wives, they had children. I had nothing. I accompanied the Prophet ﷺ to feed me. So I was with the Prophet these four years, 24-7. And I faced days where I was starving, totally uh, uh, hungry. So I used to meet Abu Bakr, I used to meet Umar, and I stand in their face, Salaamu Alaikum uh, Do you know the hadith of the Prophet where he said something like that? And he says, I know the hadith more than them. Just I want them to look at me and say, yeah, the hadith is so and so. You look hungry, come and I will feed you. And then none of them would say such a thing until the Prophet once saw me lying in the masjid. I, was, I, I thought I was dying. And he said, Abu Huraira, follow me. So I thought, whoa, now this is yani, my luck. So he went with the Prophet and he said, when he entered the home to his wives, do we have any food? Abu Huraira's eyes lit. Ah, alhamdulillah, now I'm going to get my meal. So they said, no, Prophet of Allah, we don't have anything except one glass of milk was gifted to us by so-and-so, our neighbors. So I said, okay, milk is good. It does the job. So he said, Abu Huraira, he said, yes, O Prophet of Allah, here I am. I'm here. Can you see me? Okay. He said, go to the masjid and call the people of As-Suffa, the totally broke people who only live in the masjid. They have no houses, no cupboards, no clothes, nothing. Totally broke, like you. He said, <laughs> go call them. There are 80 plus of them. Where is this? But it's a direct order. So I left with an eye on the glass, but ah, couldn't do anything. So he went. He called them. So the Prophet said, invite them in ten by ten. Not all of them. Ten people at a time. So each one came. The Prophet drank from it and gave it to them. And they drank their fill. And they left. Another ten came. Another ten came. Another ten came. And then, when they're all over, the Prophet said, Abu Huraira, drink. Why? There is an authentic hadith, by the way. Remember it, huh? A lot of the Muslims don't know it. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the one who hosts people to drink, he's the last to drink. So if you're coming to drink, uh, to, to host the guests, and you're pouring them some colas or some fizzy drinks or some juice, some of us pour themselves and drink their food, but then, okay, here, no. You give the whole of the guests. This is the sunnah. 
and the last one to drink is you. So Abu Huraira, when he saw the Prophet telling him, drink, he drank. The Prophet said, after he returned, drink more. He drank, drink more, until he was stuffed. So the Prophet said, drink more. He said, by Allah who sent you <laughs> with the truth, there is no room except for breath. Khalas. And subhanallah, one glass. This is the barakah. When people say, akhi, the barakah is important in our lives, this is what we mean by barakah. Someone who works in an interest-based bank, riba, and he gets maybe 15, 20,000, 20, your, your currency is strange. Uh, 10, 20, 2,000. Yeah, and he, some, in, in reals, he gets 100,000 reals. This is 10,000 uh, KD. Everybody, whoa, big salary, big Musharraf main, good job. And if he resigns because it's haram, you're crazy. Why are you doing this? And he gets a job for 10,000 reals, 1,000 KD. Allah puts more barakah in it than the 10,000 KD. How? Ya akhi, you buy something, it lasts a month. You buy a car, it never breaks down. You buy uh, uh, um, things for the house, your children don't get sick. But when you have a huge haram income, and Allah takes the barakah, the food is not sufficient, the clothes don't last, the kids go to a hospital frequently, you have so many accidents, there is no happiness, there is no tranquility. The barakah is sought after from Allah Azza wa Jal, through following the Quran and through following the Sunnah and halal rizq. Okay. Mm. What was number four, five? We finished four? Now number five. To breathe outside the utensils, the, the, the vessel. So when you drink, you have to keep it away to breathe. So you do this once. And then you drink a second and a third. The Prophet والسلام, as described by Anas, he used to breathe out and away from the vessel three times. And he says, this is more satisfying, this is more uh, uh, nicer, and this is more best or better for health reasons. And this would be easy on the stomach. So it would take its intake little by little, rather than blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, it expands in a few seconds, and it would be not healthy uh, for it. Number six, to consume moderately when you drink. Some of the brothers maybe drink a liter of juice, a liter of cola, a liter of something. Yani they fill themselves up. And the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, if you must, then one third of your stomach for food, one third for your drink, and one third for your breathing. This is moderation. So is it haram to fill it up? No, it's not haram. But it's not healthy. In the hadith of Abu Huraira, what third did he fill? The whole three fill, th uh, thirds. The third of the food, the third of the water, and the third of, of air. He filled it up to here because he doesn't know where the, when there will be next chance to eat. So he, he was hungry. So was it haram? No. The Prophet would have told him والسلام, that it was haram. Seventh, uh, etiquette to praise Allah after you drink. And this is what the Prophet وسلم, used to say, Inna Allah la yarda. Allah is pleased when a servant eats a meal and he says, Alhamdulillah. Or when he drinks a drink and says, Alhamdulillah. Allah is pleased with you. And in the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, whenever he ate or drank, he used to say, Alhamdulillah, 
وسقى وسوغه وجعل له مخرجا This is one of the great blessings and favors of Allah that we don't يعني, uh, um, recollect what praise be to God to Allah who has given food and drink and made it easy to swallow and then provided an exit for it imagine if Allah Azza gave us food and drink and it was not allowed to exit our bodies what would happen stomach ache we would have poison in our bodies we would have so many illnesses but we go to the toilet we do number one number two and we don't pay attention that Allah Allah relieved me Allah gave me the food and gave me a way out of it and this is why when you look at the dhikr the prophet used to do والسلام, it shows you how much connected to Allah he was because all the time his mind his soul was connected and praising Allah جل, for the gifts that many many of us don't see don't notice don't contemplate on and we take things for granted why did Allah جل, did not do this for me why did Allah deprive me from this and that subhanallah Allah gave you so much no 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 I wanted this particular thing Allah did not give it to me and this is ingratitude that we live in when you look at the glass and you say it's half empty Shaykh Allah did not give me a lot people who are optimistic and grateful would say it's half full although it's the same glass but people perception of things differ and this is why you will find people who are happy and content with what Allah has given and you will find people who are always complaining uh, eight to begin when you offer drinks with the people on the right and when you drink something and you want to pass it over to someone you choose the one to your right the Prophet ﷺ was brought with a glass of milk mixed with water and to his right is a nomad a Bedouin and to his left Abu Bakr he drank from it and he gave it to the nomad to the Bedouin Abu Bakr is next to you and he said the right then the right indicating that the right is to be given first and in another hadith he was brought with some drink to the right of him was a young boy in another narration it's Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas was like 10 11 years of age a young kid and to his left the elders and the yani, uh, uh, people of uh, yani, uh, uh, position Abu Bakr Umar and the elders so after the Prophet finished السلام, he asked the boy Can I, do you allow me because he was on the right would you allow me to give it to Abu Bakr and to the elders he said no Allah I don't allow you I wouldn't be in my right mind to allow you to give such barakah to the people on your left no I'm more worthy so the Prophet gave it to him and uh, uh, he drank from it now we have confusion who should we begin with the elders or with the right the scholars say if you are sitting in line you give a must to the right there is no exception for that but if they are sitting in front of you or you're coming in to the gathering and you would like to host then you begin with the elder because there isn't a preference to bring to begin from right or left but if I'm here and I have people to my right and left I have to begin with the right if there is no preference they're all in front of me I begin with the elders part okay number nine yeah mm. of course part of the etiquette is that it is totally prohibited to drink in gold or silver utensils 
and vessels. And this is found in many five-star hotels. And I've been around the world in, in, in five-star hotels. When you ask for, a, for tea, they bring you in a jug of silver. And you can see it's silver. When you go to eat, the utensils are gold or silver. It's different than the room service. The room service people put in their bags so they can steal it. But in the hotel itself and in the restaurants, it's made of gold and silver. It is totally haram to consume it and uh, to eat in that. And also, it is totally haram to eat with your left hand. This is a thing that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from doing. And he said that eating and drinking with the left hand is a treat of shaitan that Muslims must uh, avoid. Uh, how much time? 10 minutes? Okay. So all of this was uh, at before Dhuhr time. And whenever alayhi salatu was salam wanted to gather the Muslims, the gathering point was always in the masjid. So whenever there's something of importance, he would send Bilal or anyone to call as salatu jami'ah, meaning that prayer gathers people, come to the masjid. So they come and he would either speak to them about something he wanted to advise them about, or if he wants to send an expedition or a group of the army to a, a specific place, he would do so. Or if there is a revelation that came and he wants to announce it to them, he would do that. Before the whole time, the Prophet used to take his siesta. And this is a, like a 10, 15 minute that would energize his energize you for the rest of the day. Because remember, the Prophet was awake since when, Sam? Since the middle of the night, before Fajr. He was praying night, he just took a small nap before Fajr, and then from Fajr until Dhuhr, you're talking about six, seven good hours. So this 15 minute breaks the fatigue and the lack of concentration and re-energizes you with the grace of Allah and is part of the sunnah. The Prophet says, alayhi Take your, the middle of the day nap, your siesta, because the devils don't. So it's part of the sunnah. And I know a lot of the executives in the corporate world who would take this yani, sacred 10 minutes, 15 minutes before Dhuhr time. Even in their offices, they would tell you know, their secretaries that I have 10 minutes uh, important meeting. And they just doze off for 10, 20 minutes. And mashallah, it gives them a lot of energy for the rest of the day. So if it's time for Dhuhr, the Prophet ﷺ hears the Adhan and he's his, in his house. He repeats after the Mu'addin. And then he prays four rak'ahs, sunnah, two by two. And in the remaining time for the iqamah, he would utilize it either to speak with his wife and to joke with her and to have a good time or to attend to his grandchildren and play with them. And this was the norm because he loved his grandchildren. And when Bilal notified him that it is time for prayer, he used to go to the masjid directly. Sometimes the companions would find him coming to the masjid with one of his grandchildren. That was always the case in Dhuhr. And there are so many hadiths. One of the hadith is uh, uh, of Umama, uh, Umama uh, bint Abil As, his granddaughter from Zainab. So he came to the Salat Allahu Akbar, he's carrying Umama. Whenever he went for Ruku' and Sujood, he placed her on the ground. And whenever he stood up, he picked her up. How would you think, or what would you do if you see the Imam do this? 
nowadays, you probably throw your Android phone. If it's iPhone, no, you won't. It's too expensive. You throw your Android phone at him or your old Nokia. Why? Thinking, oh, it's inappropriate. And some people are so ignorant. They would make a fuzz of nothing. It's inappropriate. How does he bring his child to the masjid and pray carrying? This is a lot of movement. His prayer is invalid. Akhi, the Prophet did it, Ali Sassan. Uh, maybe the child's uh, nappy is uh, full with uh, urine. Maybe there is najasa. His prayer is invalid. Yaqi, how do you know? So people make assumptions and they make ideas of their own, neglecting what? The proof. Our master, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did it. So you are more Roman than the Romans? It doesn't make any sense. So don't judge things by your own whims and desires. Always before you judge, look for an answer, for an answer in the Quran and the Sunnah and follow and comply. Not the opposite. Don't come up with an opinion and then, okay, let me see what supports my opinion from the Quran and Sunnah. Because this is manipulating uh, uh, the religion. The Prophet's Salat of Dhuhr was the second longest of the day. And unlike a lot of the Imams nowadays, unfortunately, Dhuhr is very quick. It takes six minutes, seven minutes. The companions say the Iqama of Dhuhr used to be given. And one of us goes all the way to Al Baqir, you know, the graveyard. Al Baqir is an open area outside the outskirts of Medina to answer the call of nature. They didn't have public toilets in their, uh, or, or even toilets in their own homes. They had to go outskirts of Medina. So one would go, answer the call of nature, come back to his home, perform wudu, go to the masjid, and pray the first rak'ah with the Prophet. How long was that? A lot which means that the Prophet ﷺ used to take his time in Dhuhr prayer. And after finishing the prayer of Dhuhr, if there was something of importance, the Prophet would give them a khutbah, a reminder. For example, once he prayed Dhuhr, and after he prayed Dhuhr, he saw men from the tribe of Mudar, but they were so poor that their clothes were torn off. So the Prophet's face changed. And he went to the pulpit after the Dhuhr. <coughs> and he praised Allah, offered salutation upon the Prophet والسلام, And then he said, spend for, from your money. Make a visor between you and hellfire. Someone spends from his dates. Someone spends from his sa'a. Someone spends from his mud spend from whatever you can and he kept on reminding people and the people were sitting really interesting listening to the prophet giving khutbah nobody moved but then one of the companions stood up and rushed to his home and came back with a huge sack and bag barely able to carry it and went in front of the prophet and dropped it the moment the companions saw this, they all stood and went. And they brought whatever they can from their homes and a big pile formed in front of the Prophet The Prophet's face glittered and started shining. And he said, مَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً حَسَنًا فَلَهُ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا يَنْقُصُ مِنْ أُجُورِهِمْ شَيْءٍ Whoever does open the door for a good deed and people follow him, he will get the reward of all those who followed him on the day of judgment without anything being extracted and reduced from their good deeds. Imagine if you have a child, two or three years of age, and you teach him how to read the Fatiha and he reads it for another 60 or 70 years. Every day he reads it you're rewarded. Imagine if you have a colleague 
and you teach him how to pray duha and he prays duha for the rest of his life and you're home sleeping the meter is ticking so this is one story uh halas we have one minute okay okay by the time okay you remind me inshallah we stop that uh, his reminders after dhuhr inshallah wallahu a'lam bi nisbatil ilm alayhi aslam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyyina muhammad